Take a person, take a story, take you on a journey. It's your take. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> um, this is a very special um, your take, probably the most special. And um, we get to do it, we can even call it my take, given that it's your take coming out under your take, my take, because it's your take now and I'm going to take <laughs> information um, and share it with the world. Um, so, okay, so I have questions for each of you, um, James and Kirk. And we've been just just to say for me, this was so much fun. I love the podcast that you did. I love the series. Uh, I, I love the idea of the caricature being there because it's something that you see all the time. And it really sets a tone for it in a very kind of like, I feel like your artwork, Kirk, is um, uh, de deeper into what's happening. Like it's funny and stuff but it's also accurate and um, mm. you're, it, like you see a little bit into our souls, our musical souls. <laughs> and I think that's very special. And so I think the partnership that you guys have is really cool and I hope it, it morphs into something else or continues into something else because it's really, it's awesome. And um, I think the questions, James, that you've given to people and the opportunity for them to share themselves and their careers is for me particularly was really really awesome um and not only the fact that we're you know i'm sitting here in baltimore across the water uh, across the atlantic ocean and if i was Dwayne eddy i would be singing <laughs> but um I, I don't i love his voice um so um yeah so the, the whole thing is just very very is great and a great great contribution so okay i'll get started um do james do you feel that you s complete um that you accomplished what you set out to accomplish with the podcast i think in some ways we probably overachieved hmm. um because initially it was an idea and the idea was to take people from all walks of life who had an interest in career and to kind of dissect that and kind of go back to the the kind of very roots from their upbringing the childhood what their relationship was like with their parents what particularly inspired them to pursue a particular career or did they go off in one direction and then lead off in a in another one so initially it was um an an idea and then obviously kick start with the first interview and i suppose you're a little bit nervous there's a slight apprehension because you've never done this kind of thing before and i'm certainly not a journalist i've never qualified as a journalist or done any formal training so you kind of learn as you go along but i think we kind of overachieved in a way kurt because over the course of about two years, we ended up going from your take episode one to your take episode yeah. 107, something like yeah. that. So yeah. you don't worry about you know setting up a podcast with anything you put on YouTube, you've you've it's people like consistency. So I was worried that uh, maybe we put one or two up, then it just dry and we'd lose interest. And we'd struggle to find people, but we did say maybe to snowball and one person will recommend someone else, and that happened. So a lot of predictions about it happened, and we were lucky to have one guest after uh, another. So my art desk was just filling up, and James was sending me a picture and he was saying, "This is the, this is um, podcast." whatever number and I do the outline and he said you know a picture of this is number so and so so I'd have it all lined up and I'd structure the work and um yeah it, it took off very quickly and and we were running with it it was good fun yeah I, clearly clearly very good yeah I mean I think what sets your uh, podcast apart from others is that depth that you did and the comfortableness 
on my end of it as a person, you know, just really meeting you in this virtual world. Um, and also having done gazillion interviews before, um, not so much, not as many Zoom, obviously, I think that more came out of um, obviously the uh, COVID, but um, the pandemic, but um, for good, that's a great thing that, that you know, that that did happen in, in this way, but yours I, was definitely unique. And um, yeah, I think it was, I think it's cathartic for our society, for each of us to be heard. And mm. your, your questions allowed us to be heard and get nurtured that way. Like, okay, this life I'm having actually makes sense <laughs> to some degree. And, um, and then, um, yeah, and it just just the whole t tie, tying in of it. Yeah, every, every, we've all said that everybody in life's got story to tell. Yes. Even if, you know, even if they're not a celebrity, they, they've got stories and uh, it's good to hear them. And I, I guess they like to express it. Me and James, in, in the past, we, when we've, we've done gigs with Sydney May or whatever, we've met real characters and... We just listen, like listening to the old boys and tell their stories. So, so again, your take was a bit like that, where we just let's ask these questions and questions that they normally would not be asked. Because imagine you know a star of a sci-fi show and having to go to a convention and be asked the same questions again and again. They even those people will want something a little bit different. So maybe the people that come on the show on, on your take like that as well. Maybe you like that. Def absolutely. Absolutely. It set it apart. And also that you clearly had done your homework, <laughs> um, you know, to uh, to a graduate level of, 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 of study of, of like, so the angles and the perspectives that you brought forward or allowed me to look at and bring forward and share were really good. Fans of mine love that podcast i mean it's it's personable and personal and i got to be vulnerable but in a safe space so yeah, because it's fans like to to know everything about the star and what makes them tick to a certain degree so uh and james was really good he says he's got no qualifications in um but he, he, I took my hat to him for, for doing all the research because all I've got to do is try and get a likeness right. <laughs> Which is a, a unique talent in in and of itself. I mean, most like, you know, I would say 99 people, people out of 100 cannot do that. So that's a rare and beautiful talent. So no, think, that's great. But, but also... I think, um... James, you're, one, one last thing is that you have an instinct about it. So when you say you're not professionally trained, I think the training that you have that you're born with and that your natural curiosity and the tone of your voice and your presentation takes it to a place that is very professional. And that's, you know, that's a gift, but that, that, don't write that off. That's, that's very important good <laughs> uh. i think i was lucky in a way because kirk and i come from a, a similar background and we're from the same generation and our main interests are mainly creative you know i'm big into cinema and music kirk's more so into television nostalgia so a lot of the the guests we had on my knowledge was a little bit second nature i felt quite at home you know in terms of knowing a little bit about the history of cinema and certain names and, you know, and, you know, a bit of background. Um, and the research thing, part of the reason I wanted it to be so detailed and, you know, do my homework was the last thing I wanted to do was have a guest on and be in the midst of an interview and then think, well, this guy doesn't actually really know my music. He's not aware of my work or my output and like Kirk said earlier on you see a lot of interviews or listen to to interviews where people ask the same recurring questions yeah. um, particularly in the mainstream when film stars are publicizing a, a new film or a musician a new album or a set of live dates and I think some people get bored of the, the same questions and 
I think the more it's difficult at times because you want to bring out some emotion and some things that are personal or difficult in someone's life. But I think that can make the interview more interesting if they if they're willing to open up, which isn't always the case. Mm -hmm. And in that case, you never know where the interview is going to go. And there's been a few interviews where they've gone in a certain direction and then they've gone in another direction and the guest has opened up in a, a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the research I didn't know about because obviously I, you know, it's kind of an, an odd setup because you don't know them and it, it steers it in a, an interested angle and you think, Oh, I didn't quite expect this. Where, where's this heading? Yeah. Well, I, um, it, 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 it was amazing. Um, so when you went, so I guess I, I, I'm, I'm, we're getting towards this answer, but I, but for you to actually, each of you to answer this, um, are you happy with the overall, with the overall results with the project? I think. Yeah, I think, um, to do over a hundred interviews in two years and it almost feeling like a, a full-time job because I was doing a, a day job on top of a, a hobby, I guess, if you want to call it that, is kind of an achievement. Um, I'm happy with the majority of the interviews. I think all the interviews are, are good interviews. Um, I think we had a good selection of guests from different backgrounds. It became quite music orientated, but overall, I think most of the interviews are sound apart from maybe one or two that I'm not overly happy with. And when I look back at some of the early episodes, um, I think I got better as I went on and developed slightly. I think mm -hmm. if you look at some of the early interviews, I repeat myself a lot. There's a little bit of signs of nervousness and my posture is a little bit all over the place. Like I'm sat, sat like slumped down a few times. <laughs> and I, my cousin who was watching a couple of times said, come on, sit up a bit and, you know, <laughs> you know your, posture, your posture's wrong, you know. But, but overall, I'm happy. That's fine because um, you learn along the way, as with anything, and you kind of hone and, and, and um, refine is the word. You refine lots when I'm drawing because that's what you do. You lay down a, a template and when you start working and creating, you refine over and over to get the path straight to whatever it is you're doing. So if anyone said, hey, you should do this, you should try that, um, it's good. Um, I think for me overall, it's it was a good project. Um, I'm a bit miffed when I, when I see some of the celebrities later because uh, and their hair is a different color or they got a few more wrinkles than my cartoon. <laughs> 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 it looks like that now, but I've drawn him like that. He's going to contact me and say, hey, I got them. but that's never happened. Because so, that, that did happen in the past. I did a portrait of someone with about 15 years, and I drew a guy with grey hair. And it turned out he had jet black hair when I gave it to him. It was just the light hit him and created kind of streak. And I interpreted that as a grey streak. So when I was giving it over, I was like, what the hell have I done? <laughs> I almost took, I almost made sure I got it, got the cartoons as close as possible. And the thing is, if you're a perfectionist on things, it could drive you nuts. You want something absolutely spot on and perfect, and perfection does not exist, but you can get close to it. So in a way, the whole thing was a discipline for me not to, 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 to just do them and move on and not obsess about it. I have OCD. I've had OCD for like 30 years. And that kind of just works its way in on everything when I draw, even choosing a piece of cardboard, even um, taking money out of a cash point. I think James saw me store once when I was taking a, a 10 bucks over. He said, I saw you, you got stuck then, didn't you? So that's the OCD. So the OCD I have creeps in, and it did creep in on a, a few cartoons. So I have to kind of stamp on that. So that was a kind of discipline on my OCD in a way. So it, all this, this little project gave me so much discipline to deliver. So um, I'm quite grateful to it. 
that's yeah. yeah that yeah that you're a true artist kirk i mean that's that's the whole thing is that you never want to stop working on it you just have to abandon it at some point and yeah. when you're, when yeah. you're on line and it's got to be it's just like well they're piling like you said they were piling up you had so much to do um it it is good i imagine it was it was painful and maybe even torturous but you came out with good product and it was, it moved on so that's good not, to not be stuck is good too so. yeah, because if you for any project well and you do it over time in sections and that's the way it works you do one day you do uh, say, say I was sent the picture now, I probably, tonight I'd do an outline in pencil, and the next day, day or a few days later I'd do the ink, and a few days after that um, I'd do the, the colour. I would never do any cartoon or drawing ever in one sitting, because you, cause time helps, because you kind of go back and analyse and tweak, and you take pictures of it and you compare it, and you flip between the picture on your phone and the picture that you're copying and you just refine it over and over until right it's ready to go let's put the ink on and um, which is my favorite part of creating any any drawing um, i love line work i love black and white and pointillism which is what I, I used to start with years ago and the color lasts and then i kind of photograph the, the artwork then blank the background out edit edit it a bit, tweak it, and add the text, and off it goes. So that's pretty much the little structure of how I work. And I still use it uh, today for what I've got down on, on the table. Ah, it's great. It's great. It, it It's successful. That's that's the whole thing, right? I mean, it really did, it did, really did work. It really does communicate. Um, do you have, James, do you have ideas for um, other podcasts or... Um, not at the moment. Um, I'm working on um, a documentary at the moment, um, a film documentary that's been in production now for around about four or five months. Uh -huh. And it's it's a music theme documentary called Not Fade Away. So uh -huh. I'm in the process of making that at the moment. So that's been taking up a, a lot of my time. Uh -huh. um, and it, it's basically, to cut a long story short, it's about kind of several things it's about growing up um my dad was a huge rock and roll fan of the 50s and roots music and his hero growing up was a um, guitarist called Dwayne Eddy who he absolutely idolized and in the mid 60s when he was about ooh, 13 years of age maybe a little bit younger he met him by accident at a gig before the actual gig and got him to sign some LPs that were in a, a rucksack that he had on him. Yeah. And um, they struck up this friendship, which I find odd because there was such a big age difference of about 10 years. And they ended up keeping in touch. And in the six, late sixties, my dad would go and meet him when Dwayne lived in London. Um, and Dwayne offered him a job to be his roadie at one point. Um, so growing up, I I met Dwayne Eddy at an Everly Brothers concert backstage with my mum uh, around about the age of about eight. And I kind of grew up, luckily, seeing a lot of the rock and roll legends being taken to these gigs in my home city of Bristol. So I saw Jerry Lee Lewis, Chuck Berry, Carl Perkins, Little Richard, a lot of these greats I felt really fortunate so there's that strand and we're kind of talking to people on the the Bristol music scene about their involvement in bands and yeah. some of them were lucky enough just in cover bands to play with the likes of the Beatles and the Stones support them I spoke to one guy who became um, an A&R man for Virgin Records and went on to RCA and he was lucky enough to work with um, Hall and & Oates mm. and do some promotion for Dolly Parton and oh. um, got to know George Martin. And this is someone um, Kirk knows, a guy called Mike Tobin. So we've been talking to quite a lot of interesting people linked to music, musicians, promoters, 
a man who used to own John Lennon's jukebox. That's another story in itself. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a story about people's love of music, um, the culture at the time, the different cultures, subcultures, how they in, interacted and also the conflict between them. So like mods and rockers and punks and rockers, that kind of thing. And also um, passing music down through the generations, uh, music you heard for your, your family, your parents' influences and how that stems, how you discover stuff off the back of those influences. And I kind of say that through listening to rock and roll, it kind of got me onto other things. And by the age of about 16, I became a big record buyer, buying CDs. And I kind of discovered Bob Dylan, the birds, Buffalo Springfield, the blues, all from those kind of early influences, really. So, yeah, music kind of is a big part of my life, I guess, hence yeah. making the film. Yes. It seems like a very natural segue into making a documentary on these things. It's it's part of the, uh, definitely the next part of the journey. It's great. It's great. Um, okay. Was there someone um, on your wish list that you still would like to interview? Well, I think we're <laughs> Yeah, we could be here all night. There's one in particular um, who I think Kirk have vouched for because there's a little bit of a backstory, which I'll let Kirk explain. But I would say the actor Malcolm McDowell, and I'll let Kirk tell the story because this story leads on to the reason why we did the Your Take YouTube channel. Um, ah. So, yeah, over to Kirk, because he'll it's a little bit yeah. of a backstory. I think it was um, a few Christmases back. I was bored, and um, I had an email come through about cameos. And uh, uh, during the lockdown, all the actors were kind of out of work, but they were doing these things called cameos, where we do a bit of camera, and then you had this nice little video. If you were a fan of them, their work... Um, and I thought, well, such Malcolm McDowell from Plotwick Orange and If and Oh Lucky Man, Star Trek Generation, lots of things, too much, too much. And um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Plotwick Orange. There you go, there's the Corona Milk Bar t shirt from this film. Um, and I looked him up and I thought, oh, I'll, uh, James is a fan as well. I'll do this for him and I'll send it over. And it gets to the point where you, you have to give a little bit of direction and, and write a little bit in the comment box of what you want this actor to say. And I mentioned something about like me and James doing a podcast and interviewing people, so I put that in. And later that day, the podcast was ready to go, and Malcolm did it, and he did it really quick, and it was a great little thing. And it's a great memory, so I sent that over to James, and... We really wanted to get Malcolm again proper to come on and, and do it. And we, we both tried his agent, but uh, even at, what, 80 now, he's still a busy man doing voiceovers and film roles and TV. Like I said, too much. Um, so that explains the beginnings of um, your take. And I think that was one guess I really, really wanted to have. Uh, on on the show because I was on YouTube the other day and I saw a 1960s show called Zegars, black and white, and Malcolm was in it. And I wow, he can he did so much TV before he became megastar. And um, I would love to ask him questions that he's not been asked before. You ever what's it like working with Stanley Kubrick? Oh gosh. <laughs> so, we, we would have, me and James would have to sit down and think, mm, yeah, definitely Caligula somewhere. Um, but, um, yeah, that's where I would have approached the, the kind of questions. Stuff that um, was not familiar. The stuff that people kind of, like I say, fans, uh, no, actors get all the time. So that's why I would have approached that. But for me, he was kind of the number one guest. Awesome. Don't disappear. <laughs> oh, 
You'll be like this. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Here you go. Well, well, it's not done yet. And clearly, if he's busy, maybe if he slows down a little bit, he'll have more time to, um, you know, to. to uh, get uh, if he sees this on YouTube, Malcolm, please come on the show. I love you. Well, when this comes out, I'll tag him in my, uh, in my social media and say, hello. Yeah. Yeah. yeah shout the, other, out. the other one I'd like to have done and sort of name dropping a little bit, and it nearly happened. And the agent said, you know, when she's back in the UK touring, you know, there's a possibility. And that's Suzanne Vega, the musician. Oh, um, yeah. um, I've always been an admirer of her music as a songwriter. I saw her live um, going back around about eight months ago, and she was she was great. And she's she's good on stage because she has stories to tell about you know a life story and romance and quite an interesting romantic story that she tells on stage and people she's met over the years. And there's a a little bit of cynicism as well thrown in, and I think she'd, um, I think she'd make a very honest, open, and good interviewee. And I think she's quite humble, yeah. D despite having that sort of early commercial success, yeah, yeah. I've, I've um, actually met her a couple of times. I opened for her wow. during the first um, tour. Uh, uh, her first you know, national tour when when um, her first album was coming up and doing so well and in Baltimore at, at Johns Hopkins University and I remember <laughs> she had her whole band and everybody was like on different levels on the stage the stage was really cool and at the time it was me and my sister you know me and my guitar and, and Cindy my sister and we would sing and um, uh, and I remember her coming, so we did our sound check, you know, we brought in like my little lamp, whatever and everything, but it was great sound. I remember loving that. That was like one of our first really good openings. And for, it was probably for about, mm, I guess about 800, 900 seats in the theater. And so um, it was big for us <laughs> at the time. And so um, um, when she got onto stage, like everything was done, like everything was done. Basically what she did was sing like three lines and she was really tired. And I said, I feel so sorry for her. It's like, she's got, you know, something night after night after night. And my sister said, you feel sorry for her. Everything is done for her. So <laughs> this stuff, all she does is have to come on and do three lines. And I was like, she goes, we have to get in. We have to load everything. We have to unload everything, like to yeah. do everything, you know, we're promoting. <laughs> You know, putting our flyers everywhere and all the things you did in the late eighties. And anyway, it was, it was, it was definitely funny because Cindy was right. I mean, that, that's true, but you know, it is, it is exhausting touring. So there there's that too, but it was just kind of funny, but yeah, I, I spoke with her backstage at um, Newport folk festival and she was awesome. And then I did a, a women's thing a couple of years ago, somewhere up in new England and Sarah Borales was on the bill and Suzanne Vega was on the bill and it was it was nice it was it was a hot day outside i remember it's hard to keep your guitars in tune when it's super humid like that either inside a club or outside you know when it's summer um but uh but of course it's worth it because it's a lot of fun but yeah i think she would be she's very bright and i think she has a, a demeanor that's really kind of unusual because she she almost seems like a shy introvert but then you get to actually know what she's thinking um not to mention a really great songwriter too so she's sorry i'm this is your interview and i'm talking to no, you i'm really impressed that you've um <laughs> yeah been on the same bill as suzanne vega yeah, yeah. yeah. it's impressive yeah. yeah she's great um so i think you you may have touched on this answer but i'll um i'll i i, I think we did talk about this a little bit is that um do you do you feel more confident now that you've done you know, a hundred plus episodes um, uh, at, than you were at the beginning, and um, I think I think that and I think you talked a little bit about that. That yes, you do. And <laughs> yeah, I cut, in some ways, like in another lifetime, I would have loved to have been a journalist. And I did go to art school, and I studied um, film and media, and ended up going into radio. So <laughs> some elements of journalism crossed over although I'm not a qualified journalist but part of me I think's always wanted to be 
a journalist. I enjoy writing and I watch a lot of current affairs and political programs. There's um, a program, a late night show that I watch religiously most nights called News Night. It's quite a big show here in the UK, which mm. is about world affairs and uh, what's going on here in Westminster and a lot of these politicians get a good grill in from the, the journalists. But over the years, the level of journalism um, on Newsnight has been quite highbrow, quite high quality. And part of me is always fancy, like sitting in that hot seat or that chair and interrogating <laughs> someone about their misdemeanours. But then part of me thinks, well, it's harsh in a way, because what if you were on the other foot of the interview, you know? So, yeah, and it's, it's interesting seeing what different interviewers bring to the table like we had a big interviewer in the UK television radio personality called Michael Parkinson I don't know if you've come across him he had a, a show that stems back for to the 70s doesn't it Kirk mm -hmm. and there was the chat show was kind of a big thing well it has been in America as well and it with Letterman and you know some of those big hosts oh, yeah very much in Britain in sort of the 70s and 80s, it went for a real peak um, and it was just almost done to death. I think it almost died on its knees in the end because it became a bit like Hollywood at the moment, making all these comic book and remakes and rebrands of things that, you know, remakes, rehashes. Mm -hmm. The chat show was kind of the in thing and everybody did it. Um and now it's almost gone a little bit out of fashion in a way. But, yeah, I'd say in the 70s and 80s, Kirk vouched for me. It just peaked. Everybody seemed to have a yeah, chat show. Um, Parkinson was, was, and he's still regarded now as number one talk show host. And he used to go out Saturday nights, I think, at 11 o'clock. And he would have the stars of the day on there, big stars from Hollywood, um, I think he interviewed Orson Welles, Richard Burton, David Niven. The, the list is just endless. He's Muhammad Ali. Um, James and, Cagney did a great interview with him. Yeah, Robert, uh, uh, we could Robert, be here all night. Um, and of course, it, it, like James said, it peaked and went away. And they brought his show back in, I think, 1998. And that ran for another seven years. And he got some great guests. He got some awkward guests, a bit like Meg Ryan. Um, she was a bit hostile towards him. And you can find that clip somewhere on YouTube. Um, Rodman was, was good. He was a little bit hostile as well. Um, so it was business as usual when it came back. And um, Michael's, what, he's nearly 90 now, he's got to be. But um, he's, he's um, no, he was great. He really was fantastic, number one, I'd say. And then we had Michael Aspel. He tried to be lightweight, <laughs> and he has he had good guests, but they were often ruined by um, Oliver Reed and um, oh gosh, James, you you mentioned he came on the show. What's his name? Jerry Lee. Yeah, Jerry Lee Lewis. Yeah. Yeah, he was he was not he was on form in his own way, you know, but he wasn't playing by the book. So yeah, he, he followed Parkinson, but. Those were the top top ones in the in, in the UK. And then you, if you go through the 90s and now everyone gets their own TV show, but it's very superficial, it's not in depth, it, it doesn't dig like the shows like Hard Talk, which is on BBC late at night, and like James says, news night. So they're, they're, they're the best show. I remember to look them up. <laughs> yeah, to be honest, the one that was the biggest influence was probably Hard Talk and the only times I ever saw it was if I was on a holiday somewhere in Europe and I'd turn on the television on an evening, it would come up on the BBC World Network and uh -huh. it was a late, late night show and they just, they'd have all sorts of guests. One week they might have David Cosby from Cosby, Stills and Nash. The next week they might have some diplomat from, you know, um, next week it might be um, a world leader. Um an author, a well-known writer. But what was good about the interviews were good journalists, but they'd ask very direct questions 
and they weren't afraid to ask them difficult questions. So if, for example, the guest had addiction problems, they delve into that area of their life. And the guests always seem to be very good at opening up about their demons or their issues. And that was pretty much the main focal point of this BBC series. And it's still going now. Wow. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I'm trying to think of the, the guy, main guy who's normally on it. They they changed the host, but it's Stephen. Oh, it's gone. Um, but yeah, it's um, Hard Talk. It's BBC. Cool. And yeah, it just it kind of influenced me a, a lot, really, to do your take. I, I don't watch um, when I'm in Europe uh, because it's so awesome to be in Europe. I don't watch a lot of television. And I also feel like the culture there isn't to watch the enormous amount of television that I watch here or that most Americans do. Um, but I do think that that's a, I think that that probably was the seed for a lot of very cool shoot off kind of shows, even our our constant 24 um, seven CNN and Fox News and um that the, actually i should say that which shall not be mentioned <laughs> news um and and msnbc um they they have frequently a host of 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 of, of journalists speaking and stuff but there is a lot less of co confrontational they you know they more will take the same side so it's not as um, they don't give much airtime to people that the, of, of agendas they're not supporting. Both all, all those news broadcasts, and um, and I think I think it's unfortunate, but I think it, it, I, I guess the idea is not to to support someone else's agenda, not to give them even this much exposure. So right. I suppose that's part of the idea. <laughs> but it, it's sad. I mean, it would be good to to fight it out, <laughs> and and you know. And, and and find out, you know, wh wh why someone got to that thing. But I guess a lot of it just comes down to following in our country anyway, following the money and seeing how that like sort of provided the fine, you know, that 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 formula formed the view of that particular politician or something. The, the journalism here is kind of um, a little bit different in the. Newsnight had a famous, a well-known journalist called Jeremy Paxman, who's retired now, and he had a reputation for always being very confrontational. Hmm. And if he would get a politician, for example, who'd been involved in scandal or financial backhanders, he would go for the jugular, and he built this <laughs> reputation up for being a difficult interviewer if you had a checkered past but unfortunately since he's sort of retired he's still a television personality but he's no longer a interviewer or journalist mm. everybody seems to do that now it's become like the stereotype yeah, yeah. yeah. That, it's frustrating now because a politician can't really get a word in edgeways because the journalist from question one will literally just go on the attack before they've answered the question. They're on to question two, uh -huh. second form of attack. So it's almost become, it's almost like he created a caricature in a way. Mm -hmm. And all the journalists seem to follow this trend where no one can really be given five minutes or a, cup, a sound bite to answer anything because they literally are like a pack of wolves, aren't they, Kirk? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Piers Morgan does it all the time. You know, he, he'll ask someone a question, they'll stop chatting, and then he did, he, he'd ask another question or in, in, interfere interfere again before the guy's even answered the question. And then everyone goes, well, let me speak, let me finish, let me finish. You get that kind of thing going on all the time. Yeah. Uh, it's frustrating. Um, so, okay. Was there, um, so this is, this is, um, this is, this is a, a James question. Was there a frozen moment that you recall? When you say that, do you mean a disappointment? Um, no, I mean like, well, I, again, we, you, you touched on this a little bit before, like, like, 
you were just like, you just didn't know, like the answer was just so caught you off guard. So you yeah, didn't know where was, to go. You were like, oh, okay, well, like turn the I, boat around kind of thing. <laughs> there was, there was one that really touched a chord. Um, I interviewed a guitarist who was, um, who played rhythm guitar for Martin Offler. He was in Dire Straits. Uh, his name's Jack Sonny, American guitarist. And he met Knopfler when he was working in a guitar shop uh, around about the early, late 70s, early 80s. And Mark was just going into this guitar shop buying fenders and amps and different gear. And they built up this friendship. And he ended up joining the band when um, a guitarist called Hole Indies left in about 1983. And he joined them at their peak when they were massive off the back of Brothers in Arms. Wow. And um, a little bit of a guilty pleasure, but I kind of was a bit mad on Dire Straits when I was about 16, 17. Um, I was absolutely, Kirk's going to laugh. I was kind of quite obsessed with them, and I would play this alchemy concert all the time, pretending to be Noffler. And what do they call it? All this air guitar? And yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I just, you know, I just really like them. I don't know why. Um, they just kind of hit big time, I suppose, again, through the rock and roll influence. And so we did this interview with Jack Sonny about um, playing on the Brothers in Arms album, playing at Live Aid, playing the Brothers in Arms tour that I think they was everywhere from America to UK dates to Australia. Um, they went to the Middle East, Israel. So he was talking about that hectic tour. And then when he left Dire Straits, he had another successful career as um, worked in marketing and was a director of um, a marketing company that were marketing guitars, I think, in guitar equipment. And we got to the end of the interview where I asked people there the questions, um, what's your favorite film? What would you like to do in another lifetime? And I just happened to say, I said, it's incredible. You achieve so many things in different guises from being a musician to being, he, he was a writer as well, to being head of a, a company. And then he got quite emotional and he said, but I might have achieved this and you might look at me with some admiration and envy that you would have loved to have done this yourself. But I lost, I lost one of my daughters in a road accident and none of that matters this success the dire straits none of that matters because i lost my daughter in this tragic accident and i didn't know this at all and it kind of hit a chord because i kind of thought yeah you might look up to people and with admiration and wished you were in a a big band a lot of us would have loved to have been a movie star but you kind of realize that at the end of the day they're human beings. We're all we're all the same. Whether yeah. our career is successful or not successful, whether we do an office nine to five job or we're a stockbroker, we all have issues. We all have problems outside of what our careers are, and it it kind of it did hit home a bit in a way to me. Yeah, yeah and it was it was a good a, an interesting interview, but also very sad that. He'd had all that success and had been very lucky in his career. But ultimately for him, that didn't really matter because he lost his daughter tragically. Bad. Mm. Mm. It's deep. Yeah, that'll, that'll, that's, mm. I, I understand. I think, you know, I guess if you've lived uh, a bit you you do understand it yeah it's that's tough and it's something he can't control you know there's some, there's i mean why does why do we have these lessons to learn those are the most difficult a child should never die before the parent it's just horrible 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 well at least he was able to speak with you about it and i think when people do open up that way to their sadness and to that part, it allows other people to go, yep. I mean, like mm -hmm. it, 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 it's healthy in, in, in that way. 
Um, and it is, it's all human. It's, it's the great leveler. <laughs> uh, mm, okay. Um, okay. I want to ask Kirk this question because I've been wondering about it. Um, do you, and, and, and I'm very interested in your answer. Do you take, and please, I hope you won't be offended by this question. Do you take your art seriously? Um, more than anything. I do. I, I, when I'm focused on it, I'm really focused on it. I might, might piss my girlfriend off big time. I think mean, I said, said before, you know, if it's the whole thing. I mean, you, for, for any artist, you get an idea in your head and then you're kind of, wow, how will I do that? I want to do that. And it kind of immediately stimulates you. And then even at the beginning of the process of it, if it's a sketch or, or someone wants to create a riff on a guitar, it's a, it's a mini journey. And you get so engrossed in it, um, nothing else around you matters. Everything becomes very superficial. And you and me, I mean, I, I could get really obsessed. I mean, I'm working on a portrait now, and I've spent two days trying to get the eyes right. And and I delivered a portrait last week, and I slaved over it for two weeks, and I got the best I could, and they loved it, but they had an issue with it. And when you hear them say that, you kind of hot your heart sinks. You think, well, I'm not that good at, after all. But then again, musicians, comedians, artists, they get that. So you start analyzing why, and, and I immediately put four portraits into production. And, and because you, you, if you get bad advice, um, you can just a downward spiral. So you kind of, no, let's get back on the horse and go again and, and work. So I'm working on stuff now. I'll probably be working tonight on it. But I take it seriously and, uh, because it's always been there in my life. It's never betrayed me. Friends have come and gone. But this, this talent, it's always been there. It's never betrayed me. I could pick a piece of paper, draw a cartoon, draw anything. And to have that gift is... is Great. Right. And years ago, my OCD would jump on that and say, well, what if you can't draw anymore? What if it goes wrong? What if it doesn't work? And I did have that overdrawn sketches of it for people. Because the thing about your take was it was consistent. So I fell in with this um, strong, disciplined um, work method where I would just do the cartoons and put them out. Um, I not have to worry about it. So it's ironed out those creases, but um, I, I love it. I mean, it's not just cartoons I do. I do, um, you know, black and white sketches. I used to do stipple sketches. I do erotic art. I do abstract art. I've got loads. I've been trying my hands at everything. And someone said, well, what sort of art are you doing? I say everything. Um, because you've got to have a go. And that's what big teams do. Uh, we've got to have a go. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. You learn from it. So yes, I do. I take it really seriously, um, and that's what gives me sleepless nights. <laughs> <laughs> I gotcha. I gotcha. Totally. It it really matters. I wanted to say that. I wanted to ask you that because I wanted to hear what you were going to say. And I also think that that because they're caricatures. I don't think people really understand the depth. Um, but as me viewing it, I was definitely drawn in and and uh, uh, yeah and i i think and you're uh, when, when, when people say uh, caricatures i call them cartoons because what defines a cartoon big head big head small body three fingers and a thumb um caricature is when you you take someone if you've got a big nose or big eyes you exaggerate those i don't exaggerate anything on the face because i want the person to see it and go, ask me instead of is that meant to be me and when that meant to be me, I, I feel that I felt. So I try to get it as close as possible. Um, some of my favorite works and I've got in my portfolio that I really must put out and frame sometimes. Uh, but it's the kind of cartoons and I mean, many standards of people that I sell on Etsy and eBay. Um, 
people like those, so I do lots of them. But I, I like I like doing a black and white portrait. I haven't done a simple portrait in in nearly 20 years, which is basically pointillism, where you do an outline of a person's face and you sit for hours doing ink dots to make up the, the tone in the shadow. And it just takes ages. And I, I looked at one of my portraits recently from that era, and there was just thousands of millions of dots in there. I thought, wow, this person must have no life to just sit there and just go, you. I haven't done that for a long time. It's basic line work now and, and sketches. So I might do one one day. I might do a pointillism one day. But um, a lot of lot a lot a lot of work, a lot of time. Yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome. Um, um, do you think that you work too hard, or do you feel it's proportionate to the passion that you have? to the work, to the art. Well, I, I just work as hard as possible to get it right. And um, when you take it, because I, I, usually the the rate of getting it 100%, the portrait, the face, I get it. But when you get a little mark, you're kind of right. How dare they? Let's go back to the middle of the board. I don't want, because like I said before, you, if you get the tiniest knock and the knock grows, you start doubting yourself and your ability, and and I don't want to ever go there. So I, like I say, get back on the horse. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Are you? Um, and I guess this is a good question. It's really for both of you. Um, have you been disillusioned by any of the people? Like they sometimes say, you should never meet someone who's one of your heroes because who they really are, the more you find out about them, maybe you don't like them as much as you did before you got to interview them. I, I, I've met a few miserable actors in my time. And um, I remember I, I saw a guy from a well-known drama series, which is still running after, what, 40 years. And I said, hey, you were, you were great in that show. And I uh, bet you miss all that, didn't you? And he said, no, not particularly. And... <laughs> And I, I, I've, I've met people who are behind the scenes on shows, and they all seem to be miserable bastards. They all look at, oh, I work with him, don't like him, and, and oh, it went so good. And he, you've got all these people that want to be famous and fame and that kind of stuff, but when you, you meet them in real life, they're just miserable bastards. <laughs> maybe have their struggles so fair play you know they're artists as well so i you know each to their own but uh, maybe it's bad days so i catch people on bad days maybe who knows yeah. it, i guess there's a learning curve to how you think you are to how you actually present to yeah. other people um and maybe you know i don't know maybe they yeah. <laughs> Interesting thing, isn't it? That's the interesting thing. You see all you see TV and movies, and it's all flash bang, well, glamour and cat box and that, that kind of thing. And for me, it's, it, it, that's all fakery. That's all part of the business. And people buy into that as, oh, I want a piece of that. That's amazing. The life of it must be fantastic. And but it's not. It's not. And I, I, um, I, I it's really real. It's interesting you mentioned that because I was watching a a documentary last night and there was uh, a couple of lines that were reeled off by the person who was the subject of the documentary that you would have loved. And it was a documentary on William Freakin, the filmmaker who's just died, who mm. did The French Connection, The Exorcist, right, 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 right. Um, Sorcerer, the list goes on. And um, I like him as a personality because he's a very straight talking uh, man. Like he says what he thinks. Um, he's not rude or obnoxious in any way because he's got a great knowledge of cinema and the history of it. And he has a lot of respect for the, the pioneers or the people that he calls artists. And there was a great bit in the film, like towards the end of the film, he was in Venice promoting a documentary 
he was screening a documentary that he'd made about a real exorcist. So he'd gone back from making a, a fictional adaptation of the novel, The Exorcist, to actually making a documentary. And he said, he said, the thing I find crass and ridiculous is he said, I'm happy for my films to be screened at festivals, but I never want them to be in competition. And he said, I might have won an Oscar, but to me, it's complete bullshit. Excuse my language. Why should a film be compared to another and put in competition with another film? Mm. How can you say, and he gives examples, he said, how can you say that Casablanca is a better film than Chinatown? Or how can you say that 2001 is a better film than Citizen Kane? He said it's subjective and... He, he was just interesting. I thought that was an interesting... I, I agree with you know, that. For, for every, every film, you know, each to their own in subject and tone and and story. Um, why, why should they be in competition? They don't need to be. But it, it's one of those things in America where you put them all together and everyone has an excuse to dress up and go to an award show and kiss each other's asses. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's pretentious. <laughs> yeah, I I don't think that's that's not what it's about. If you would if some someone said said to me, and I will say this to my girlfriend, if me and James were nominated for an award uh, for anything, Ch- chance to be a fine thing. Chance to be a fine thing. We'll be able to do it. They'll be like, well, let's just go down the pub. <laughs> Let someone else collect it. You know, I'm not. It's not about that. You know, as. Uh, yeah, that, I think a lot of the sort of they're like, they're like kind of the non-celebrity celebrities are far more interesting. <laughs> um, I think that's true, but it's it's that collision of 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 business and art, and um, some people are very good at that, <laughs> and some people are better at one or the other, you know. And I think it's. Um, you know, I guess it just depends on timing and 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 other things. And in, in, in the- <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Well, I um, is there anything that you wanted to say or God no, bless your, your God bless your girlfriend Kirk because she uh, gives you space to <laughs> to do your work. And I think we all fight. We all are, you know, with these other endeavors that we have, I think whether we're spending time, you know, leaning over, uh, you know, our pens and, and drawing boards or behind a microphone and in our headphones or for me, like with my guitar and or my vocal exercises, well, well, put up with us, you know, we're lucky. <laughs> my girlfriend would sit on the sofa and do crochet and uh, or, or jump around at the table. And I'm doing a cartoon or a big portrait or whatever, and, and we just got a cup of coffee or a mug of tea, and that's as good as it gets. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's fun. It's fun. It's good. It's good. Cool. Well, here's to the longevity of you guys, James and, and Kirk. And it's funny, James Kirk. I'm thinking of... um. Okay, James T. Yeah, Kirk. James T. Kirk, yeah. <laughs> William Shatner. William Shatner to Star Trek. Yeah. I, knew, yeah. I knew there was a connection. Like it's been like going in my brain for two weeks now. But um, but thank you. Thank you very, very much. And and I wish you the best. Good fun. Thanks a lot. And yeah, all the best with your um your new album. Thank you.